that I use in my confirmation class and Sunday school uh, and youth club in order to teach about the Bible and the geography of the Holy Land. Uh, the game is to get the 18 Bible treasures like Herod's crown and Peter's net and things like that hidden around the three maps. And you have to move the square character, clever clocks, to uh, find uh, where they're hidden and stand on the right letter and press D. But you can see the character with P on him yes. is the wicked Dr. Plunderverst who uh, goes around trying to steal them from you if he can find them first. See, now she's found one. You've got to identify what uh, treasure you think you've found at that place. Yes, she's got it right. How do you know what treasure's going to be there? Well, for example, Peter's net is going to be found at Capernaum because that's by the Sea of Galilee and he was a fisherman. And uh, Herod's crown will be found at the palace and so on. I must say, I'm, I'm, there must be something wrong with me, but I hadn't really associated vicars with computers before now. Well, you'd be surprised. We produce about 1,200 of these magazines, the church computer, uh, every, well, three times a year. And uh, we've got about 700 members of the church computer users group. What do they use their computers for? Well, lots of people use it just for administration, for typing all their sermons and letters, and for uh, filing, keeping records of the... Uh, of uh, the weddings they've done or things like that, or the church accounts, uh, all sorts of things, even to plan the preaching uh, has been done. I index all my hymns so that I can choose all the hymns on love or which hymns go to certain tunes, and uh, I, can, I produce the hymn list for the choir yeah. each week, and it prints them out all automatically. How far have we got? Well, they're just looking... Oh, they're just moving from Israel to Jerusalem, that's right. And so... Plunderburst is looking for Herod's crown, which will be up on, dare I say it, letter E. So, yes, Clever Clock is racing. I don't remember Dr. Plunderburst from the New Testament, you know? No, I don't think he's actually in the Bible. <laughs> um, he's a modern character and a very wicked one, I might say. Yes, they found Herod's crown. There you are. Is this all written in basic? It's nearly all written in basic. There's uh, uh, about 40 bytes of machine code that uh, reprint the map again and again so that it doesn't get... Uh, rubbed out every time you move a character around it uh, and a big letter routine but apart from that it's nearly all basic how long did it take i hate to think hundreds of hours <laughs> <laughs> yes my wife thinks that computers are the work of the devil <laughs> my wife agrees with you <laughs> <laughs> well they may be right reverend hartcastle thank you very much all the best yes how many have you got have a list. Oh, you've got the cross. Well, from a rising star, let's meet a shooting star. And there it is. We'll be using this as part of a game called Monster Zap. But this is what we're aiming to get first. Just get something moving across the screen. Now, once we've done that, we could perhaps use our moving thing up there as a, a moving target, the sort of thing that you would get in a duck shoot or an arcade game. Let's see if I can zap it from uh, over here. Wait till he comes by and fire. Ah, missed. Never mind. Alternatively, we could sort of turn the game upside down, decide that there's a laser up there. Perhaps uh, the, there are some aliens invading from the far reaches of the galaxy intent on destroying poor unsuspecting television presenters. Good, good grief. Anyway, the first thing we've got to do is find out how to print something anywhere on the screen. Now, you and I may think of a television screen as a window on the world. But the computer thinks of the screen as rows and columns, making a kind of grid. Well, here's a simplified version. And here's the top left-hand corner. Anything that's printed on the screen can go into one of these boxes. For example... Now, computers like to start counting at zero, so this row, the top row here, is row zero. And this column is called column zero, not column one. Column one is next door over there. This is row two, column one. This is row one, column zero. This is row one, column one. Get the idea? Okay, let's put some numbers in. Here we go. 
And now let's post me to a new box. How about row three, column four? Well, here we are. This is row three, column four. On this grid, we've only shown a few rows and columns. The spectrum actually has 32 across, that's columns 0 to 31, of course, and 22 down. On the electron, or the BBC micro, you've got a choice. We'll use mode 6 this week, so we get a screen 40 across by 25 down. And you can easily post a symbol to any box you like on the screen. With an electron, you write this. Print tab 12,5 asterisk. With a spectrum, you write print at 5,12 asterisk. Now, this is the way we'll be showing you the listings throughout the series. Electron on top, spectrum underneath. And we'll label them to remind you which one to look at. Notice the different ways we ask for a particular screen coordinate or, or box. The electron insists on having the column number first, that's 12. And the spectrum insists on the row number first, 5. It doesn't matter, of course, they're both equally good systems. But you have to use the system your machine uses, or, or you'll get in an awful mess. So now we can get our symbol onto the screen. Next, we've got to get it moving. To do that, we'll have to change those numbers. That's how we make the star move. First, we need to give the row a name. Well, R seems a sensible sort of name for it, and C would be a reasonable name for the column number. So let's change those numbers to R and C. But remember, R and C are really numbers. So, here's the first part of our program, and I'm giving it quite a high line number, 170. That way I can put other bits and pieces in front of it if I want. But we haven't told the micro what numbers those names stand for. So let's do that earlier in the instructions. Let R equal 5, let C equal 12. Those two lines set up the numbers. Now, because R and C can be varied, they're called variables. And what we've just done, giving them starting values, is called initializing the variables. Oh, and while we're about it, you electron users will need to specify mode 6 as well, to get the right screen arrangement. Do that right at the beginning. Now, if we run the program, we get our start just where we want it. But it's stuck at row 5, column 12. We want it to move. Well, we could make it appear to move if we printed it there, and then there, and there, and there, and there, and there, and, and so on across the screen. But that sounds like a lot of printing and a lot of hard work. Well, not necessarily. Let's take a look at a useful device, the loop. 